Welcome to this edition of Senior Moments. I'm so excited about this day because I get to spend some time with Charlie Maupin. He is quite a character and he lives here at the Covenant Woods Retirement Village in Columbus, Georgia. And I met him through my friend Nona Christie who happened to write a song about D-Day. And as she was telling me about the song, she told me about Charlie Maupin and I've had the pleasure to meet him today. And we're gonna talk a little bit about D-Day, but most of all, I wanna talk about Charlie, and he's going to be 100 years old soon, so uh, he's very, very into Facebook and all modern technology, and is very friendly and outgoing, and I just want him to share a little bit about his life story, because it's very interesting to me, and I know that it will be interesting to you. So stay tuned, and we'll be talking with Charlie Maupin here at Covenant Woods very shortly. So here we go, we're talking with Charlie Maupin here, and I'm just gonna let him tell you a little bit about himself. Charlie, where are you from? I'm from Columbus, Georgia. Uh, well, I was born in Columbus, but my mother was here on a visit. My folks lived in West Point, Georgia. Mm -hmm. But she wanted to have me born in Columbus, uh, delivered by the old family doctor, because she was originally from Columbus. My father was from New Haven, Missouri. But uh, anyway, uh, we lived in West Point until I was about seven. And uh, we moved uh, to Columbus, and I've lived here ever since then, except for about three years in military service. Oh, well, what branch of the military were you in? Huh? What branch of the military were you I in? I was in the 29th Division, Infantry Division. It's a Maryland National Guard Division. I was activated in 1940 into the regular army uh, due to the situation that existed in the world where Germany had started the war uh, with Russia and others. But uh, I uh, lived most of my life in Columbus and the interesting thing is the high school I went to, my father was the principal of it uh, before I went there, of course. Uh, but uh, he was principal from 1910 to 1917, Columbus Industrial High School, OCIHS, uh, which now has been converted into Jordan Vocational High School. But, uh, <coughs> excuse me. But another interesting point of that is my mother was a student there at the time while he was principal. But uh, they didn't marry until he left the educational system. I went into the banking business. But uh, I've lived here and uh, uh, went to school here all my life and 
1942, December 1st, I was drafted into the military service. Uh, in the meantime, I had married uh, my first wife at that time, uh, early in 1942. But I was uh, drafted in uh, 1942, December the 1st. Uh, I was inducted in the military service, but uh, the group I was with was sent home until the December the 8th. We were ordered to report back for active duty on the 8th of December. So on the 8th of December, 1942, I left home. And I didn't get back home. I see my home again until October 17th, 1945. Wow. 34 months and nine days. I counted them. That's a long time. But I spent 28 months of that overseas. Mm -hmm. Uh, approximately 11 months in England, uh, training for the big push, uh, which is codenamed Operation Overlord. Uh, the actual amphibious operation, which involved a crossing of the English Channel from England into the continent of Europe, was codenamed Neptune. And that involved uh, over 150,000 troops, uh, 11,000 airplanes, and about 5,000 ships, the largest amphibious operation in history. And, and what was your job? Uh, what did you do? What was your job? I was a radio operator. I was trained in, in basic training. I was trained as, uh, in uh, Morse communications, in semaphore, which was the waving of the flags, mm -hmm. and in Morse code, dots and dashes. But in combat, we only used Morse communications. Uh, I was a radio operator with a SCR 300. Uh, and I was a battalion commander's uh, radio operator. And usually the way he went, I went. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that was my job as a radio operator. So I never fired a gun in, in combat. And I carried an M1 and carbine rifle uh, along just for protection. But uh, I had several close calls, and, uh, but uh, anyway, the operation on D-Day, uh, which is 6th of June, 1944, uh, was called D-Day. D-Day was a term that was used in other military operations. It meant the departure date mm -hmm. for an operation to begin. But due to the fact that uh, the size of the operation Neptune D-Day has become synonymous with the 6th of June, 1944. Yes, sir. So every time you think of D-Day, that's you think of the 6th of June, 1944. Well, uh, I, my division, the 29th, along with the 1st Division, was scheduled to land on Omaha Beach. But the land, actually, there were five landing beach areas, the salt landing beach areas, that were chosen by General Eisenhower, who's commander of the uh, of the Allied European Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe. Uh, they had chosen five uh, landing areas. We assigned two of them to the Americans, Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sword and Gold and Juno were assigned to the British and Canadian troops. It so happened that the 29th Division and 1st Division were assigned to Omaha Beach. And it happened to be the most strongly defended beach of all the five beaches. But uh, the uh, 29th and the 1st were scheduled to land on D-Day. And the 29th Division was comprised of three regiments, the 115th, the 116th, and the 175th Regiments. I was assigned to the 175th. Where all the elements of the 1st Division and the first two regiments of the 29th landed on D-Day. Mm -hmm. But due to the uh, confusion on the beach here, the, the beach had not been cleared sufficiently to allow the 175th to land. So my outfit couldn't land until the next day, which is referred to as D-Day plus one, mm -hmm. the 7th of June. And excuse me, that is the name of the song that Nona Christie wrote D-Day yeah. plus one because of your story. Yeah. Yes, you inspired that. 
The song was written uh, by uh, Hayden Sabbath, uh, uh, Nona Christie's daughter yes. and her daughter. Hayden. Uh, who uh, I talked to about my experience on D-Day on D plus one. Because when I landed, uh, the, uh, the beach area was covered with uh, dead American soldiers. There were just rows of dead American soldiers. They were covered with the ponchos. Our graves registration had not had time to, to come in and to remove the, the bodies. But uh, it was a terrible sight. And uh, uh, well, that morning, early morning, I was on uh, up D-Day. I looked out and I saw all those ships across the channel. As far as I could see were ships, mm -hmm. all kinds. And the naval gun, uh, ships were, were blasting the shore defenses. Well, their big guns were going off. And they were trying to uh, knock out as much of the German defenses as they could. Unfortunately, they weren't too successful. And even the planes that came over, their bombs dropped behind the German lines. So uh, when, when the first waves landed, especially on Omaha Beach, uh, the cottage was terrible. It was, it was just uh, uh, thousands of American soldiers lost their lives on D-Day. My uh, family uh, didn't know where I was going. I, when I left Columbus for military service, uh, the group I was with was sent to Fort McPherson, in Georgia where we uh, received our tetanus shots and the shots that we were supposed to get and uh, uh, were actually in, vaccinated uh, uh, into the service. But uh, from there, uh, I was sent to Camp Cross, South Carolina for basic training. Mm -hmm. That's near Spartanburg. Well, of course, I couldn't tell my wife uh, and my family in like fact, my father died in early 1942, so he wasn't living there. Uh, my mother and my wife, Frances, uh, were living in Columbus, of course. But, uh, uh, my mother was upset about me going in the service and uh, uh, leaving, leaving there. But uh, anyway, at Fort McPherson, well, I went to base training camp across South Carolina near Spartanburg. Uh, while there, we went out on the rifle range one day. And when we came back, you know, there was a notice put out that there was a case of meningitis in camp. So they uh, advised anybody that had a fever to report to the medical, uh, medical station. So it so happened that I had a temperature. I wasn't feeling well at all. So I was put in the hospital in uh, isolation for 72 hours until they could determine what my problem was. And I finally found that I had a strep throat. But I did have a fever. But I stayed in the hospital for eight days, been treated for it. So the uh, training company that I was with had moved on. Uh -huh. So when I was discharged from the hospital, I was put in a, another company that was two weeks behind in the training that I was originally with. So it meant that I spent 10 weeks at uh, Camp Crop instead of the basic eight weeks. Uh -huh. But when we left there, we were sent to uh, Camp Shenango, a holding area up above Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we stayed there for a couple of weeks, and then we were sent down to Camp Kilmer in New Jersey which is a shipping, drop, uh, shipping off point for troops going to Europe. Well, that's where the code came in. It was, uh, I was unable to tell my wife where I was going or where I was. So what happened, uh, at the service station there, they had a, a group of operators that took calls for the servicemen. Mm -hmm. They would take their number and their names and they would place the calls. Okay. And when the calls went through, they would call the servicemen up to take the call. Well, time passed and it came, about, it came 11 o'clock and my call hadn't gone through. So I went up to the operators and I said, well, just forget it. 
Uh, it's so late. I said, no, no, we can't forget it. What I didn't know was that the phones were, were uh, cut off after that date, after Sunday night. It was Sunday night. The phones were cut off. We were not allowed to make any phone calls after that. So the operators knew that. So they finally got my call through. And uh, all I could tell my wife, I talked to my wife, was that, uh, do you remember the old poem, Trees? Trees? Trees. It's a poem called Trees. Trees. Okay. I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. Uh -huh. Written by George Kelmer. Yes. So uh, I don't know whether at the time she caught it or not, but uh, anyway, that was the only uh, clue I could give her as to where I was at the time. Because I couldn't mention anything about going overseas. At the time, I didn't know where I was going. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, the uh, original training company that I was with in basic training, I heard was shipped to the Pacific. And the group that I was finally with, the written section group, we were all shipped to Europe. So we were, uh, uh, took the ferry over from Bayonne, New Jersey, to New York Harbor. Then we boarded the Queen Elizabeth the uh, two uh, British sister ships, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. They were transport ships for taking American troops to Europe. So I was on the uh, Queen Elizabeth. There were about 18,000 of us on the, on the ship at one time. There were a contingent of uh, nurses on there too. But every trip the uh, Queen uh, ships made the German propaganda machine would put out a, a propaganda to the American people that the ship had been sunk. Oh, no. Every time, every trip they made, the Germans would broadcast it was sunk. But the problem was that the ships were too fast for the submarines. Uh, 28 knots was twice as fast as a submarine could travel. And also they took a zigzag course across the Atlantic. They didn't go straight across. So the German U-boats uh, had no way of knowing where they were going. But we landed in the of Clyde, Scotland, in four and a half days, which was really quick. We were crossing the ocean 3,000 miles. Uh, in Glasgow, Scotland, we uh, boarded a, a train in Glasgow, Scotland. It took us down to Litchfield, England some old uh, British uh, barracks that uh, we were quartered in before we were to move, move to our uh, permanent assignments. But we stayed there and I only saw one person during my visit overseas that I knew from Columbus. And he was a second lieutenant, cad, part of the cadre at the barracks that we were in in Litchfield. His name was Neil Stokes. It's amazing to me that you can remember so many details about this. Well, some of it's real vivid and some of it is real hazy. Uh -huh. and some of it I can't remember at all. But there are high points or certain points that I can remember. Uh, but anyway, after a few weeks there, uh, I was assigned to, uh, sent down to uh, uh, Devonshire, England, uh, to uh, Camp Den Denbury near Newton Abbott, England, which was 10 miles from Torquay. Mm -hmm. the, French, the British Riviera, the Torquay was a French Riviera, and the Newton Abbott was about 10 miles away. Well, camp Denbury, the military camp, was about three miles outside of, Denbury, of uh, Newton Abbott. And that's where I joined. I was first assigned to a rifle company, the L Company the 3rd Battalion of the 175th Regiment. Uh, because I was a, a sharpshooter with a Browning automatic rifle, so I was put on a VAR team, which consisted of two men. Uh, one man to carry the 21-pound rifle, and another to carry the ammunition. Well, I didn't like that at all because I was trained as a radio operator. Mm -hmm. But because I was a sharpshooter with a VAR, they needed somebody on that team. But that only lasted a few weeks. I was finally 
such as communications platoon and headquarters company's third battalion. But I wouldn't put in radio, I was put in a wireless section. And I learned to install field telephones. But finally they put me in the right spot. I was in radio, put in the radio section. And that's where I stayed during the war. But, well, uh, let's talk about the difference in technology now. Um, for, for those of you who are in the military families right now, it's such a blessing for you to be able to talk to your loved ones on the phone because back in those days, y'all were writing letters. And it took a long time for the letters to get back and forth, and sometimes they would get lost. And you, I know you had other ways of communicating, and you were right on top of all of the modern technology at the time for communicating, and you still are. You're still interested in that. But, um, you know, children these days can see their daddy on the computers at night. They can tell them good night and things like that. But when you went, you, like you said, it could be months before you would see your family and you couldn't tell your family where you were. So I know that had to be incredibly stressful. Well, that's true. It was but because uh, we could never tell them where we were. Mm -hmm. uh, all of our mail was addressed to an APO address or an address to, uh, a mail uh, we got from family mm -hmm. was addressed to an APO uh, address. Uh, what we uh, did, we were given emails. They were uh, uh, just a one sheet that we wrote a letter on and we folded it over and sealed it. But uh, it was so it could be censored, easily censored. Okay. Because every letter that went out was censored. Okay. Uh, in case anybody decided they wanted to try to divulge some information right. to the family member, you know, that they weren't supposed to. So uh, that was our means of communication, was strictly uh, by email. And uh, uh, I, I wrote a few home to my wife and to my mother. Uh, my mother was disappointed in, uh, in me going, that's a picture of her up there. But uh, uh, I didn't hear from her for three months after I was overseas. Um, she was real upset about the whole thing. But anyway, uh, I, I received, we received, we had mail call, I would call mail call, you know. Mm -hmm. We'd always look forward to mail call. And hoping to go to the end of time we didn't get in the mail, of course, we were disappointed. But uh, I, I usually got, just got my share of mail, uh -huh. which is interesting. So, Charlie, did, I know that I've seen documentaries about people who, uh, veterans who went back to Omaha Beach. Did you get the opportunity to do that? Well, uh, I never did get to go back on D Day. When they had the festivities, you know, the commemoration event, uh, which I was real sorry about, although I had offers to take me recently at no expense to me. Wow. But I just didn't feel physically able to go. Right. But anyway, in uh, October of 1993, my wife and I went to Europe. I uh, went first to, uh, of course, we landed in London. Uh, where everybody lands, it goes to England, I guess, uh, to Gatwick uh, Airport. But uh, we went down to uh, uh, southwest England, to Devonshire, and uh, uh, visited the places where I had trained, mm -hmm. and also down to Penzance. Uh, after training in Devonshire, for a short time after I joined the 175th, they moved the whole unit down to uh, farther south down to Cornwall, uh, where we trained in the moors of, in the Cornish moors. And my company was billeted in the little town of Penzance. Have you heard of the Pirates of Penzance? Yes. The yes. Opera? I was billeted in, in, a, in a terrace house. Uh, in terrace houses where there were units, several units in a row, you know, mm -hmm. like the do in some places in, the, in the America, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, they had moved, the, of course, the attendants out. And uh, I was uh, billeted in, the, in this house uh, for almost 11 months doing training. But uh, 
they had a, uh, uh, a, a fellow operator, radio operator from, from Tom Callahan from Oklahoma, and I would go out every morning in front of our house, and there's a Jeep parked out there, and we would operate, uh, set up a 284, SCR 284 radio. We were getting communication with the regiment. And uh, that, all, was, all of that communication was by Morse code. Mm -hmm. There was no voice involved in this. But it so happened that a radio operator at, Mo at regiment headquarters was an expert. And he was sending his dots and dashes so fast we couldn't keep up with it. <laughs> so we would send him a, a message, Diddy, dum dum, Diddy. <laughs> Slow down, we don't understand it. Uh -huh. It was Diddy, dum dum, Diddy, dot, <laughs> dot, dash, dash, dot, dot. Uh, sometimes it would slow him down and sometimes uh -huh. it wouldn't. But uh, uh, it, was, it was quite a fun. And, uh, the English kids would come along and we'd give him gum or candy, you know. Uh -huh. and, uh, he had a good time out there anyway. But uh, uh, we trained on the Cornish Moors and the most miserable day of my life was November the 25th, 1944. Uh, we were in the Cornish Moors, uh, went out on a, a training mission, and it uh, alternated raining, sleeting, and snowing. Uh, and we were out there in the Cornish Moors in an open area where there was no protection from anything. Mm -hmm. We did, dug a slit trench, uh, which is an air grave, which we dug during the war, which was just a shallow grave that uh, uh, it was long enough, low enough, and wide enough for you to lay down in and be before, below the surface of the ground. Well, even out there, we dug slit trenches as practice. But we couldn't get in the slit trench to get out of the wind. And the, well, the rain, it would have kept it up from the rain, but uh, the slit trench had filled up with water from the rain and all. But it so happened that a British contingent of troops had gone out with us. But when it started snowing and raining and sleeting, they went back to camp. They were smart. <laughs> but you guys stayed. We got soaked. And uh -huh. If you can imagine a heavy uh, OD overcoat mm -hmm. soaked with water. I bet. The weight of it, and then it soaking through your skin. Mm. Well, the uh, mess sergeant had a mess, mess camp. Uh, this kitchen set up some miles back, but he brought out hot chow and set up a uh, mess tent. But uh, the problem was the wind blew the mess tent down. Oh, no. And the uh, food was cold, but finally they let us go back to another area mm -hmm. where we were allowed to put on clean, fresh, dry socks. That was the main thing, was yes. dry socks. Because we infantrymen traveled on his feet. He had to take care of his feet above all. Right. Uh, so we were allowed to uh, pitch our tent and on uh, the rain they had to slow down then. And uh, we finally got back to camp, but we had to walk through water. It was uh, almost uh, halfway up to our knees, above our ankles, in the, in the roadway even. Mm -hmm. But uh, we survived. And, uh, I woke up one morning uh, and uh, and I pitched it, and I had put my poncho down uh, on the ground and put my blanket on top of it, and I lay on top of that in my sleeping bag. Uh -huh. And when I woke up the next morning, it had been raining during the night. It was an inch, inch and a half of water underneath. I was floating on water. <laughs> and I was afraid to move, because when I pushed down, it would scrape the water up on me. Right. But uh, anyway, uh, we survived that, but... Uh, I had uh, quite quite an experience to, to uh, all the training. We didn't know at the time exactly. We didn't know the code name for the operation, but we knew we were training for some big operation. And uh, we even did uh, went up to a certain part of uh, of uh, England where they had the high cliffs. And we repelled down a, down a cliff, and I didn't like that at all. Mm -hmm. Repelling wasn't my, uh, my thing. But uh, they just did that on one occasion. To, 
uh, actually the Rangers were the ones that did the repelling and uh, they actually do it in combat. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, anyway, we got a taste of it. But uh, we, uh, we, uh, we trained for 11 months and from uh, July, mid-July, I guess, from 44 to uh, 43. 43, I'm sorry, 43, until late May 44, where we moved out of Cornwall and moved to a, to a, 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 a port on the channel. And we boarded an LST, a landing ship tank, which actually carried troops as well as tanks. But uh, an operation and a preparation for the well, Operation Overlord, which uh, we received a communication from General Eisenhower on the 5th. D-Day was actually scheduled for the 5th of June. But uh, Eisenhower received a bad weather report, so he called off. He, we even got out into the channel mm. on the early morning of the 5th of June. At part way across the channel and we called back because of the weather report. It was rescheduled for the 6th of June. Uh, there was a slight window there uh, time enough for an operation on the 6th of June before more bad weather moved in. So uh, on the early morning of the June the 6th, we moved out uh, from our port in, uh, in uh, the coast of England. Now near, I say near Falmouth, England. Uh, I'm not sure the exact place. But uh, anyway, we boarded the LST and on the 1st of June. We were on the, on the LST for several days uh, before we actually moved out. So the waiting to go and, and not being able to tell your family where you were going and all the training that you had, getting you ready for it, you probably still were very afraid. Yeah. So how did you deal with being afraid of not knowing what you were walking into? Well, uh, you know, I wasn't actually afraid uh, more than I was anxious. Mm -hmm. It was anxiety, but uh, even the guys around me, uh, I didn't notice any appreciable uh, fear uh, apparent. Uh, there may be some who were afraid, but, you know, when you don't know what you're going to do or get into, uh, what you're heading into, you, you don't know what to fear. Right. So uh, until you get into it, it's when, when you get into it, it's when you get mm. afraid, you know. Well, actually, uh, uh, feeling fear, the most fear I felt during the war was when I went up to the front lines with the battalion commander and we got involved in a heavy German artillery barrage where the shells were hitting all around us. It's something that I hadn't experienced before. Mm. I had been in the mortar uh, uh, shells hitting around me and a few artillery shells, but this was actually a concentrated uh, artillery barrage. And I just saw the Germans knew we were there because it was right in our area. Mm -hmm. The only protection we had was to lay flat on the ground. We had left no hole, no slit trench or nothing to get into for protection. Mm -hmm. So all I could do was pray, and I prayed. I prayed out loud. Oh, let this stop. I was scared. I, I really was. When it was over, there were shell holes within a few feet of me. Wow. The portion of the shrapnel goes that way instead of this way. So uh, the little protection I had being flat on the ground to save me. And the battalion commander was okay, too. Will you tell me about your receiving your Purple Heart? Uh, that was uh, in Germany. We were uh, quartered in a large German mining building. I call that a salt mine. I don't know what it was. Mm -hmm. But it was a huge brick building that was not being operated at the time. But anyway, we were uh, quartered inside the building there. Well, I had walked outside. There was a little shed out near that building, and I was 
going looking around, and then I walked outside of the shed. And when I did, a German artillery, but the Germans had been throwing artillery in that area, mm -hmm. off and on, periodically. A German shell came and hit in a tree that was right close to me. And a small piece of the shrapnel came down and hit me on the hand. Mm -hmm. Well, it numbed my hand, and it was bleeding. But I didn't think too much about it. When I walked back inside the building, and a, a lieutenant was treating another soldier who had gotten wounded. And he looked up and he saw me and he saw my hand bleeding. And he told me to go back to the aid station. Well, I was reluctant to go back because the Germans were throwing artillery in there, off and on, sporadically. But uh, anyway, uh, he told me to go back, so I went back. Well, the medics treated my hand, which wasn't true. It's a superficial wound. Mm -hmm. But of course, they made a record of it. So that's why I got a Purple Heart. Uh, they made a record of it, which went on my record, the record. And also, I received five points. On the, it was a point system for going back home, for the first troops to go back home after the war ended. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you had 85 points, you went back home first. I had 83. 83. 83 points, wow. It was five months after the war ended before I was able to go back home. Mm. But I did occupational duty in Germany uh, during that time. Uh, a little town called Wolf It was in the Berlin, uh, in the Bremen Enclave, mm -hmm. which is called the Bremen Enclave. Uh, near Bremen, the port of Bremen, which is a port of entry for uh, supplies coming to the troops in northern Europe. Mm -hmm. But I was there for five months. And I happened to be on the switchboard, operating the switchboard, when I heard that the uh, notice come down for troops with 65 points or more when I was able to go home. Oh, 65. I bet you were so excited. Troops that had hardly been in combat. Uh -huh. And I was coming home with 83 points. <laughs> How I long did you, it I take you to get to home after that? Uh -huh. How long did it take you to get home after that? I left uh, 12th Street in September. I think the 5th of September. And I went to my train, which they call the old 40 and 8, which is used in World War One. Uh, they were freight cars that would hold 40 cattle or 40 troops. Oh, I'm sorry, eight cattle or 40 troops. Mm -hmm. Well, they had uh, 40 troops in a freight car I was in. But it took us several days to go through from Heidelberg, Germany. So in the meantime, I had been assigned to an to a artillery battalion, which was uh, quartered in a castle in Bavaria, Germany. Like in, uh, in uh, Prince Leiningen Castle. Belonged to a prince. I was quartered there for several days before we left Heidelberg, Germany, which I got the train and went through the uh, rest of Germany into France. Uh, toward a, a camp, Lucky Strike, which is several miles from uh, La Havre, France. I were able to catch a uh, boat, a uh, train, a uh, ship going back to the States. But that was several weeks in going, going. But I made a list of every town in Germany, in France, that we went through. I have it listed in a book, what I call an autograph book, uh, every one that I went through. I know uh, that you have a lot of interesting things here in your apartment that I want us to look at, but before we do that, um, can you tell me how long did it take you before you were able to start talking to your family and friends about what happened to you at Omaha Beach? How long did it take? Because mm -hmm. some veterans said that it took them years before they could talk about it. Well, uh, if I had been a combat soldier, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have talked about it very easily or quickly. But since I wasn't, I didn't face the enemy directly. Uh, uh, then it wasn't that traumatic to me. Right. 
in the sense that I couldn't talk about it. Uh, so, I mean, I can talk about the close calls. I mean, uh, I could have been killed easily. Yes. Many times. Mm -hmm. uh, Any time in a combat environment, you're subject to, to being killed at any moment. You know, you never know. But you can't dwell on it. Right. Uh, when I really got to worrying about it, uh, it was in April of 1945, a month before uh, VE Day, before the end of the war. Uh, we had been pulled back from the Elbe River, uh, where we had met the Russians at the Elbe in April. Uh, they were pulled back in, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a rest area. And that's where I uh, uh, got to thinking about that my time was running out, that the law of averages was going to catch up with me. And I, I would have given up an arm or leg to get out of it right then. Fortunately, I didn't have to. Uh, so but that was one of the, uh, the only time that I really had that great urge to get out of it. Out of, the, out of the war. But fortunately, it worked out okay. Well, we are so glad that it did, and I'm so glad you let us come and visit with you today. Well, I appreciate you coming. I appreciate the opportunity to get my message out. And I think uh, war is a terrible thing, and it shouldn't be the answer. Right. To, but uh, it's a lack of communications and between the leaders of the country. It was, the ambition and obsession of certain uh, evil people uh, that want to possess something that doesn't belong to them. And that's the way it was with Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. And uh, World War II was a just cause. And it was an honor to be a part of it. And the other thing is that more young people should know the story of uh, World War II soldiers and about war and about the reason for it and what makes this country the greatest nation on earth? Yes. Uh, the world couldn't do without the United States. Uh, there would be chaos and uh, enslavement everywhere. Uh, and the young people don't seem to realize that. And they're not being taught that in schools. And that's a terrible thing. They're not being taught the true history of this country mm -hmm. and what a great country it is and the principles upon which it's founded. And when we get away from those, we are losing the greatness that was this country. And I'm afraid that's what's happening. If good people don't stand up for the just cause and for what's right and for maintaining the integrity of this uh, great nation. Yes, sir. And the and sacrifices that so many have made to protect the freedom that uh, people have today that don't appreciate that freedom. That's right the way they should and appreciate the sacrifice and what it took. Uh, we've lost down through the ages from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War to all the small wars to the world to the individual soldiers there's no small war. But to all the wars we fought into World War II, and even Vietnam and Korea, uh, and, there, and uh, the wars we're fighting overseas the sacrifices, and people have got to kind of realize the sacrifices and what it means. If you lose your freedom, what it means to lose it. Uh, the conditions are so much worse than they realize. Yes. And regaining your freedom is uh, almost impossible. If you witness the, the freedom, uh, the, the lack of freedom in Russia and China mm -hmm. and uh, Venezuela and in Cuba, in some of these other countries, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible situation. <coughs> and that's something that good people must stand up for, they must stand up for freedom. Yes, sir. Well, do whatever it takes. That's right. Yeah. And we want to just encourage everybody out there, show this video to your family and friends. We are going to post this on YouTube so you can share this. Um, I've seen many videos of veterans that have talked about their experiences in the war and whether you actually served in combat 
Well, I'm not going to say that that's more important than people who didn't because they're all supporting each other in the effort and as well as the families. So um, every veteran has a story to tell. Even if it was they were working in the offices or ordering supplies or being a mess cook or, or being a mechanic, it doesn't matter. They all contributed. And some contributed in a more sacrificial type way than others did. But it was still a huge sacrifice for them and for their families. Absolutely. So Phoenix City and the city of Columbus, Georgia, Phoenix City, Alabama and Columbus, Georgia, have a Veterans Day parade every year to celebrate and commemorate our veterans in our area. And uh, Mr. Charlie, you are going to be asked to be the Grand Parade Marshal this year for the well, parade. Well, certainly an honor. I appreciate it very much. I look forward to it. Well, we are very excited to be able to ask you, and on uh, behalf of CTVB, I look forward to being here then. We want to thank you for agreeing to do that. And I am just so honored to be able to spend time with you today. Well, it's been a pleasure and it's been an honor. I appreciate your interest in this. And I think your message is going to get out to a lot of people, uh, which, uh, which is great. Yes, sir. And you're right about remembering the Gold Star families. Yes. And those have sacrificed so much. That's right. And when we do this parade and you see all the different branches of service together, and then you see the young people who are in the ROTCs that are going to be become soldiers, it's, it's very exciting to see the younger generation and the older generation <coughs> together marching down the streets and giving people an opportunity to say thank you for your service. Now, Mr. Charlie has had a lot of people reaching out to him, and there's some exciting things going on. Um, one day when I popped in to visit you, you had just found out that somebody was writing a book about you. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we're in the process. Uh, a fellow in California, a professor in California, that was in the process of writing another book, but then we uh, got together on Facebook, mm -hmm. and uh, he's letting his other book go to write my book. And I've been uh, sending him information, and uh, quite a bit of information and pictures. Uh, we still have got a ways to go. Uh, we're hoping that uh, to get a copy published by my next 100th birthday. Mm -hmm. yeah, and your birthday is in November, right? November 4th. You'll be 100 years old November 4th. And, uh, uh, he says his name is Arnold Martinez. Uh, Arnold Martinez? Yeah, Arnold okay. Martinez. Okay. Uh, in California. Uh, he's, uh, he says he hopes to have the book, a copy of the book, to bring to me himself and present to me on my birthday in November. That would be thrilling. I hope I can be invited to your birthday party. Yeah, you're invited. <laughs> you're invited. You're invited. Yes, sir. Well, maybe we can bring our cameras so everybody out there can see too. Right, right. We would love to, to uh, celebrate right. your birthday with you. Well, um, I want us to take a little bit of time so you can show off some of the things that people have sent you over the years. And if, if uh, you're out there and you want to know more about Charlie Maupin, you can go to his Facebook page. Right. He, he uh, puts things on his Facebook page regularly about what's going on here at Covenant Woods in Columbus, Georgia, where he lives, as well as the things that are going on around the veterans, um, appreciating veterans and the stories that you know of your friends as well. So um, we're going to show everybody, we're going to let you tell us some things about some things that people have sent to you, like this quilt back here, for yeah, example. Yeah, a quilt of valor. A quilt of valor. Now, quilt who, of who valor. made this there's quilt? A, there's a, a, a thing on the corner here. Okay. Chris, thing on the let's get there. this corner right here. <clears throat> that was uh, this is an organization called Quilter Valor okay. Quilters. And, uh, Quilt of Valor? Uh, it's sponsored by Warrior Outreach. Okay. It's all over the country, but this particular group is sponsored by Warrior Outreach. 
which is uh, a venue uh, started by Sam Rhodes Sr. Mm -hmm. and his wife Kathy. And it's out here near Portson, Georgia. Yes. Roy Outreach. I've been out there before. It's a venue for uh, wounded warriors. Can you see it? And Kathy, uh, Sam's wife, and the other ladies get together and they make these quilts. And they give them to World War II veterans. Uh -huh. Or to other veterans. Uh, several given out to the veterans in Columbus. Well, it is beautiful. But they gave me one in a surprise uh, ceremony here uh, several months ago, which I appreciated very much. That is beautiful, and I think that I see a coffee cup over here. Tell me about this coffee cup. This, uh, <laughs> wish I could pronounce the fellow's name is the Frenchman, Florent Seminole. Okay. And that is me, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, he made this for me. Now, how does he know? He you? sent it to me, and also with a key, key ring. He made that for you? Huh? He made that for you? Yeah. Okay. So, Mr. Charlie, I want to thank you so much for letting us come out and visit with you today here at Covenant Woods, and uh, I want to thank you for your service. And I want to thank you for being such a sweetheart. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I got a good stick on you. Every day he comes out and salutes his flag, and that's what we want you folks to do too. So if you are out there in the community and you see a veteran, which there's plenty of them out in our area because of Fort Benning, please stop and say that you appreciate them and uh, that we love them. Buy them a cup of coffee, buy them a meal, or just say thank you. But let them know that you do remember and you acknowledge their service for us and our country and that we can have freedom because of them and because of sweethearts like Charlie. Mm -mm. So on behalf of CTV Beam, we're going to see you next time on Senior Moments and thank you for watching.